Hello, and welcome back to General Chemistry 1. My name is Daniel, and in this video we're going to be talking about aqueous solutions. Now, the word aqueous just means anything based on water. So, all the things we're going to be talking about here are just solutions that occur in water. So, the first thing we need to do here is define exactly what a solution is. So, a solution is something where a solute is dissolved in a solvent. The most common example we can think of would be something like it's a salt dissolved in water. So in this picture, we're adding a salt into water. The salt is what's known as the solute, whereas the water is what's known as the solvent. So the solute, the salt, dissolves in the water, and you see on the right side over here that it's not visible, so it forms a homogeneous solution. So the combination of the solute and the solvent forms what's known as the solution and there's a certain concentration of the salt in that solution and other properties of the solution that we'll get into in the next two videos. Let's look at what's happening on the molecular level. So at the level of a molecule, we see on the left side we have a solid block of NaCl. The act of dissolving it in water entails the following. We see that it's being broken up into positive cations and negative anions where Na plus is and Cl minus. And what happens is water molecules form what's known as hydration shells around each of those cations and anions. The way they're arranged is going to depend on the charge of the ion. So we see in the top right that we have a small cation, and it's being surrounded by the partially negative charged oxygens in water whereas the negative anion is being surrounded mostly by the hydrogens in water because we remember that they have a partially positive charge. So this is going to occur for all the different ions that come from, come from the salt in the solution. And that's how we see dissolving something in water occur at the um, atomic level. One other thing we should note is what things will dissolve in water. So there's a rule, like dissolves like. That means that anything that's a polar compound will dissolve polar solvents. Or I'm sorry, polar solvents will dissolve polar compounds. We'll expand into this a lot more when we get into Lewis structures. But for now, it's just important to note that anything that's polar can dissolve in water. An example of that would be something like um, methanol that we'd see in the diagram over here. You can mix methanol and water, they're both um, polar solvents, and so they'll be what's known as miscible liquids, meaning they can mix together. So some of the common things that can be dissolved in water are our um, ionic compounds, like our salts, NaCl. Methanol is soluble because of its polar OH bonds, but we'll get into that more when we get into organic chemistry. And there's a few exceptions to our ionic compounds that are soluble, but we'll get into that when we look at in the um, when we look at aqueous reactions. For now, it's just important to remember that like dissolves like, so polar compounds are going to be dissolved in polar solvents. So let's get into the properties of solutions. One of the properties that can come up when something dissolves in water it is that we can see it has some kind of electrolyte character. So what I mean by an electrolytic solution or electrolyzing solution is basically just charge carriers. So these charge carriers lead to electrical conductivity of our solutions. The degree to which that happens depends on what we're dissolving in water. And so the three classifications we can see are we have strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, and finally, non-electrolytes. So what we can do is we can go through each of those and classify what species constitute each of them, as well as what their conductivities are like. So the first one we're going to look at is a strong electrolyte. What characterizes a strong electrolyte is the comp complete ionization of the molecule. So if we look at something like NaCl, it's going to 100% dissolve into Na plus and Cl minus, leaving no more molecular NaCl. The same can be said for certain acids and bases. Those are known as your strong acids and strong bases. So all of these things are going to ionize 100%. And what this leads to is a high conductivity of the solution. We see in the picture on the left that we have a very sh um, bright, shining light bulb. So there's a strong conductivity in strong electrolytes, as we would expect from the name. When you're looking 
at acids and bases in particular, it's only going to be strong, what's known as strong acids and strong bases. We'll get into more of that in uh, one of the next videos. But for now, what you need to know is the following table below. This is a list of all of the common strong acids and strong bases. So it's important that you memorize these acids and bases. That way you can classify them as strong and hence strong electrolytes. Otherwise, the most common ones we'll see are our salt-like solutions. All of our soluble salts like NaCl, anything like MgCl2, anything that's soluble, any kind of salt that's soluble in water will be a strong electrolyte. Let's move on to weak electrolytes. So a weak electrolyte has some ionization, however not as much. So let's say we have a weak acid, which is acetic acid, and this is a weak base, ammonia. So these will ionize maybe 1%, meaning that if we have a mole of acetic acid, we'll get something like 0 0.01 moles of each of the ions. So ions are formed by weak electrolytes, but not very many compared to all of the molecules that we put into our solution. And what this leads to is a very weak conductivity. There's some conductivity, but it's a very, as we can see, it's a very dimly glowing light bulb in this picture. So the way to identify a weak acid versus a weak base is going to be based on that previous table we looked at. So in general, anything, anything that you're given in your, let's say, your exams, if they don't specify whether it's strong or weak, then you have to remember all the acids in this table. So anything that's not listed here as a strong acid, unless you're told otherwise, is going to be probably a weak acid. That's going to be a lot of your organic acids, such as HC2H3O2, things with carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens. Ammonia is one of our common weak bases, and that's not on that strong base table either. But we'll get into more of identifying strong and weak bases in the, um, the next video. That's where we're really focusing on it. For now, let's go on to the final classification of, non -electroly of electrolytes. That's the non-electrolytes. So there's some compounds, particularly soluble organic compounds, that dissolve in water but don't form ions. For example, let's look at ethanol. We put in some liquid ethanol into water, and it becomes aqueous ethanol, meaning hydration shells form around the ethanol. But we see also that there's no ions formed. It stays as a neutral species when it's dissolved. So since there's no charged species, that means there's going to be no conductivity in these solutions. And you see that from the picture. So in general, anything that's a, a soluble organic molecule and not an acid, base, or soluble salt is going to be a non-electrolyte. Some other examples of that would be any kinds of sugar, like uh, this D-galactose over here. So, once again, we just said that strong electrolytes are soluble salts, strong acids and bases. Weak electrolytes are weak acids and bases. And non-electrolytes are soluble organic compounds that don't form ions in solution. So, take a minute and pause the video. See if you can identify for the following three of these which ones are strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, and non-electrolyte. So let's take a look. MgCl2. We know that's a, sol it's a salt because it's a metal bonded to a non-metal. So that's going to form the ions like so. And since it's a salt, it's going to have a 100% ionization. So this is a strong electrolyte. Our next one, um, ethanol, we just saw that that's a polar organic compound. So it's soluble in water, but it's not going to form ions. So that means it's a non-electrolyte. And then lastly, we said ammonia is a weak base because it's not in our table of strong bases. And so that means it's also a weak electrolyte. The names kind of go together well. Okay? So... It's just a matter of remembering what classifications fall under which for our electrolytes. And you'll see more problems like this in the workshop video accompanying this unit. For now, let's get into talking...